toward the end of France's dalliance with the Jeune École, French naval thinking was looking at the problem of commerce raiding with cruisers in a world where the Royal Navy existed. The fundamental issue was that all previous cruisers that they'd built were either too slow to decline combat with the faster ships in the British fleet, or else, if they were a bit quicker, they carried a relatively modest armament. In either case, a raider that got into a fight would, if it was lucky, be a raider that then needed to return home to fix its damage, and assuming it wasn't quite that lucky, it might be sunk outright. Therefore, it seemed obvious that what was needed was a cruiser that was fast enough to dictate whether or not it engaged in battle, well armed enough to win against a fairly standard commerce protection cruiser of the day, and well protected enough that such a conflict wouldn't also cause the ship to have to return for major repairs. If this sounds like a familiar line of reasoning, this is exactly the same course of thought that would drive the construction of the USS Olympia. Indeed, both that ship and this one would be laid down in the same year, 1888. But the French vessel was a little bit further down this line of thinking. Although a fraction slower than her American compatriot at 20 knots, courtesy of 13,500 indicated horsepower, delivered via a trio of vertical triple expansion engines driving three screws, she was somewhat larger, displacing on about 6,300 tonnes normally, compared to about 5,600 tonnes on the American ship, although her almost 6,700 tonne deep load displacement was only 100 tonnes or so greater than the US vessel. Her armament consisted of a wide variety of weapons, a pair of single 194mm or 7.6 inch guns, mounted somewhat unusually in a pair of a midship's wing turrets, a secondary battery of six single 164mm or 6.4 inch guns were clustered at each end in sets of three, also in turrets. The stern guns were arranged in a triangle on the same level, whilst the forward guns were arranged one on each side, with a central gun at slightly ahead and a deck level higher. And this gave a theoretical heavy broadside of four 6.4 inch and one 7.6 inch guns, but also a theoretical fore and aft salvo of three 6.4 inch and two 7.6 inch, providing you weren't too fond of whoever happened to be in the ship's upper works at the time of the 7.6 inch fired. Four single 65 millimeter guns were also fitted, two one deck above the 194mm guns, and two at the aft end of the superstructure firing over the aft 164mm wing-mounted gun turrets. For anti-torpedo boat work, eight single 47mm and a similar number of 37mm cannons were fitted. The 47mm were in sets of four on the two large masts fighting platforms, whilst the 37mm were mounted in two pairs at the top of the masts, with four more on the forward superstructure. This would later be altered in favour of more 47mm and fewer 37mm weapons. Finally, there were four 17.7 inch or 450mm torpedo launchers, these were originally going to be in fixed above-water tubes, but were replaced mid-construction with four single pivoting launchers, which were mounted behind doors one deck down from the heavy guns, with two launchers per side. Armour came courtesy of a 100mm or 3.9-inch belt of steel armour, protecting the full length of the hull. A turtleback protective deck, 20mm thick, sitting on top of 10mm of plating for a total effective thickness of about an inch, covered the magazines and machinery, joining the armour belt at its lowest edge, about 4-5 to five feet below the waterline. Beneath this, but above the machinery spaces, was a thin splinter deck that existed mainly to sandwich in a layer of last resort coal that was also held to contribute to the ship's protection. The turrets had the same armour thickness as the belt. Laid down in July 1888 and launched in October 1890, problems with the quality of the armour plate and the explosion of a boiler led to delays, which included replacing the defective boilers, and so she wasn't commissioned until 1895, with a rather distinctive and very French bow profile. Never quite happy with the ship, the French Navy sent her back to Brest in 1902 for reconstruction, which changed out the boilers again, which necessitated adding a third funnel, and that forced the redistribution of her anti-torpedo boat guns as the main mast aft, which was replaced by a simpler and thinner pole model. 
somehow this contrived to make the ship two knots slower, and she was promptly placed in reserve. She was due to be scrapped in 1910 and was badly rusting out when Peru offered to buy her after repairs were made. Reconditioned, the ship was renamed Comandante Aguere in 1912, and after the first of three instalments were paid, she was transferred to the Peruvian Navy. But when the threat that she had been purchased to counter ended up being sold elsewhere, the ship ended up being left in France. She was briefly considered for service in World War I, but was thought to be too obsolete, and so at the end of that war, having been formally returned to French control, she was renamed again to Peruvier and turned into a freighter. After extensive remodelling, she sailed in her new role as a collier in 1920, but a combination of engine breakdowns and fires in her hold meant that this would also be her last mercantile voyage, the ship being towed back to Antwerp and sold in 1923 for final scrapping. However troubled her life was, her legacy as one of, if not the, first modern armoured cruiser would be incredibly important, given how many armoured cruisers would subsequently be built, and just where that line eventually led. That's it for this video. Thanks for watching. If you have a comment or suggestion for a ship to review, let us know in the comments below. Don't forget to comment on the pinned post for dry dock questions.